Okay, so this will be part 15 of passing your check ride in an R44, and we're going to continue with rapid fire questions and uh, answers here. Next subject we're going to talk about is airspace. All right. So specifically, what we're, we're going to be uh, asking you questions on is number one, you have to identify the airspace. I'm going to point at it on the uh, on the map, and first uh, the first question will be what airspace are you in. Second question will be, <clears throat> what is the VFR weather minimums within that airspace for a helicopter? And then the third part of the question will be, what, if any, special equipment is needed within the airspace? Okay, so let's get started here. And I've got a section of pulled up on right in the center here. We're at uh, the center is Cape Dorado. Okay, so if I put my ink pen right here and I said you're at an altitude of 300 feet, Number one question, what airspace are you in? And the answer is class G airspace. Question number two, here at 300 foot above the ground in class G airspace, what is the weather minimum for a helicopter? And the answer is one half mile visibility and clear of clouds, all right? Third part to the question, here in class G airspace at 300 feet off the ground, what special equipment, if any, is required in that airspace? And the answer is there is no special equipment. You don't need a radio, you don't need um, ADSB out, and you don't need a transponder with mode C. All right. Okay, let's go over to, um, let's pick the same spot again. We're at this same location, and now we're at 3,000 feet. All right, now what airspace are you in? And the answer is class E airspace, echo airspace. All right. All right, next part to the question, what is the basic weather, uh, uh, basic VFR weather minimums at 3,000 feet right here in Class E airspace on the map? And the answer is 1,000 foot ceilings, 3 miles visibility. Your cloud clearance requirements are 500 below, 1,000 above, and 2,000 foot from. All right, All right here at 3,000 feet, what special equipment is required on board the helicopter? And once again, the answer is none. You don't have to have a radio, you don't have to have a transponder with mode C, and you don't have to have ADS-B out, right? Okay, let's scoot over to right here. And once again, you're at 300 foot in the air. What airspace are you in now? And the answer is you're in class D airspace, Delta airspace here at, a, at a Cape Dorado here. So number one question is, what airspace are you in? Again, we're in Delta. Number two, what is the basic weather minimums here in Delta airspace for a helicopter? And the answer is 1,000 foot ceilings, three miles visibility. And what special equipment do you need to fly here in this class Delta airspace? And the only thing you really need is a radio. You don't have to have a transponder with mode C and you don't have to have ADS-B out. All right. Okay, and again, here in class D, uh, the cloud clearance requirements are the same as they are for E. 500 below, 1,000 above, and 2,000 feet from any clouds. All right. Let's back up over here for just a second. Let's say that you're right here again, and now we're at 12,000 feet. All right. Now the question is, what airspace are we in right here at 12,000 feet? And the answer is, you're you're in Class E airspace, Echo airspace. The reason I mention this is because the cloud clearance requirements change once you get above and visibility change once you get above 10,000 feet. It's going to be pretty unusual to be up here above 10,000 feet in a helicopter, but if you were, the cloud clearance requirements go to 1, 1, and 1. That's 1,000 below, 1,000 above, and 1 mile from any cloud. And then your visibility increases to 5 miles. Okay, so that's class E airspace up high above 10,000 feet. Okay, so let's go to our next airspace. Here we go. Here's a Class C. This is a Class C at Evansville, Indiana. So <clears throat> let's say uh, you're right here on the ground. Oh, I'm sorry, not on the ground, but you're right here at an elevation of 300 feet. What airspace are you in? Once again, you're in Class G airspace, right? It's class E. Um, Charlie airspace doesn't begin until 1600 feet MSL here, right? And if you'll notice, the ground elevation is, let's see where Evansville ground elevation is here, 422, all right? So, uh, this one can be a little bit tricky depending on where, they, where you put the ink pen. Right here, class G goes from the surface to 1200 feet off the ground, which basically abuts 
class C airspace, right? However, if you're right inside here, remember this is the magenta shaded area all in through here. So if I put my ink pen right there, class G airspace would go from 422 basically up to about 1122. So between 1122 and 1600, which is where the Charlie airspace starts, if I was to say you're right here and you're at 1200 MSL, which is uh, uh, right about here, at 1200 MSL, what airspace are you in? You would be in echo airspace again, all right? And with all the same cloud clearance requirements and all. So over here, again, we're gonna say we're at 300 feet in the air and you're in, in Gulf airspace with all the same requirements, all right? How about we're right here and we're at 2,000 feet in the air. What airspace am I in then? All right, right here, 2,000 feet. Um, obviously, you're going to be in Charlie, Class Charlie airspace or Class C airspace. All right. What is the basic weather minimums in Class C airspace? Well, we're back to 1,003 and 1,000 foot ceiling, 3 miles visibility, and your cloud clearance requirements are once again 500 below, 1,000 above, and 2,000 feet from. Okay, third part of the question, what equipment is needed right here at 2,000 feet in the air? You're in Charlie airspace. Well, now we've got to have a radio, you've got to have a transponder with mode C, and you have to have ADS-B out, all right? Okay, if I was to leave my ink pen in the same place and I said, okay, you're, uh, you're at 6,000 MSL. Now, what airspace are you in here at 6,000 MSL? Once again, now we're in Class E airspace again with all the same requirements again as far as visibility. 1,003 uh, cloud clearance requirements are the same. But now what equipment, even though we're in Class E up here at 6,000 feet, which is above the top of the surface, uh, above the top of the Class C, what uh, equipment is required? Well, you have to have a transponder with mode C and you have to have ADS-B out. So if you're here at 6,000 feet, do you need a radio? And the answer is no. Next question would be, you know, do you, you might pose it as, if you're up here at 6,000 feet, you're gonna cross this Class Charlie airspeed space at 6,000 MSL. Uh, do you need a radio? And if you do need a radio, do you need to talk to anybody? And the answer is no, you don't need a radio, and no, you don't need to talk to anybody to go over the top of a Class C. However, you do need that transponder with mode C, and you need ADS-B out. Okay, so here's a question for you guys. Let's see if you guys have been paying attention. Let's say that you're right here, and again, we're at 12,000 feet. And the question is, do you need a uh, transponder right here at 12,000 feet? And the answer is yes. Above 10,000 feet MSL over the continental United States, you need to have a transponder with mode C. I think there's an exception for if it's within 1,200 foot of the ground. But above 10,000 MSL, you have to have a transponder with mode C, all right? Okay, moving on, let's look at uh, <clears throat> some more airspace here. All right, let's say we're right here, and again, we're at 300 foot AGL. What airspace are you in? All right, and the answer is class G. All right, how about 3,000 foot? Uh, what airspace are you in right here? 3,000 foot in the air. And again, you're in class E airspace. All right, all right, let's scoot over to here. You want to pay attention when you're looking at class B, you want to be sure that you know which uh, section that you're looking at, where the floor of it is and where the, the uh, top of it is. And this is St. Louis class B. You can see the top of it's 8,000. And like right over here, between this blue line and this blue line, the floor of it is 4,500. The top is 8,000. So if he was to put his ink pen right there and once again ask you, you're at 300 feet in the air, what airspace are you in? The answer is you're in class G airspace. All right. Come up to uh, say 4,000 MSL, still that's below the 4,500. So at that point you would be in class E airspace. All right. All right, but now let's say we're at 5,000 feet at this position right here at 5,000 feet. What airspace are you in? And you're in class B airspace. All right, okay. So what are the basic weather minimums for Class B airspace for a helicopter? And it's three miles visibility, all right? But what changes is the cloud clearance requirements. The cloud clearance requirements in Class B airspace are back to clear clouds. And the reason it's that way is because they've got you on radar. They're gonna provide uh, 
avoidance with other aircraft and so the cloud clearance requirements drop back down to clear clouds okay all right part three of the question you're at 5,000 feet right here you're in class b airspace what special equipment do you need to be right here in 5,000 feet in class b airspace and you got to have it all you got to have a radio you've got to have a transponder with mode c and you have to have adsb out all right Okay, our next questions now are going to be fly, about flying into and out of the different airports. So let's start here with Greenville, which is an uncontrolled airport. You can tell because it has a magenta uh, design on the airport uh, insignia itself. So this is an uncontrolled airport. So a question might go something like this. Okay, you're 10 miles down here to the south, and you want to fly into Greenville here. Uh, who do you need to talk to on the way in there? And the answer is no one, all right? You can fly into, the, you don't even need a radio to fly into Greenville. What is required is that you see and avoid. You enter, enter the traffic pattern if you're gonna use it, or avoid the flow of fixed wing traffic if not, and go straight to the ramp, but you don't even need a radio. Now, it's highly recommended that you have a radio and that you self-report your position going into and out of this airport, but it's not required. Again, what is required is see and avoid, all right? All right, let's go to a class uh, D airport. Let's go back down here to Cape Dorado. And let's talk about going into a class D airport. All right, so here's Cape Dorado, class D airport. And you have to have a radio to get into here, right? Okay, now, when you call them, let's say that you're eight miles to the north here. I'll pose this question. You're eight to the north here at Cape Dorado, and you call uh, in and you say, Cape Tower, helicopter 211 Tango Bravo is eight to the northeast inbound for landing Cape Dorado. And they say, 201 Tango Bravo, stand by. The question is, are you clear to enter the Class D? Well, you're cleared to enter the Class D if you heard your tail number. And he specifically responded, 201 Tango Bravo, uh, stand by. So you can continue flying right on and even enter the airspace if you need to. All right? Typically that'll happen if they're on the phone with center, they're doing something different, they may tell you to stand by They'll call you by your tail number, tell you to stand by. And within a relatively short order, a minute or two later, they'll be back and they'll come back on the radio and say, uh, 201 Tango Bravo, state your intentions or something such as that. Okay, how about, I'll give you the same scenario. You're 10 to the north up here. You're inbound. You call the tower, uh, Cape Tower, helicopter 201 Tango Bravo, 10 to the northeast inbound for landing. And they say, aircraft calling Cape Dorado, stand by. Are you cleared into the Class D now? Absolutely not. You're definitely not uh, going to be able to enter the, you're not clear to enter the Class D. All right, third scenario, same thing. You're 10 to the north, and they say, and you call Cape Tower, and you say, Cape Tower, helicopter 201, Tango Bravo. Let's say that it's, uh, uh, oh, it's a 900-foot ceilings, and you're out here. So number one, is it legal for you to be out here, 900-foot ceilings, and you're 500 feet in the air? Yep, you bet you in a helicopter it is. And you call the tower and you say, Cape, Dr uh, Cape Tower, helicopter 201 Tango Bravo is 10 to the north. Need to get a special VFR uh, into Cape Dorado. And the tower replies back, 201 Tango Bravo remain clear of the class Delta. And they'll usually tell you why, because of incoming traffic, right? And they'll tell you what to expect. You can expect a four minute delay or whatever. So if they call your tail number, but they specifically tell you to remain clear of the Delta, then obviously you got to remain clear of the Delta and comply with whatever they tell you to do. So, Okay, let's go to a Class C airport. Again, we'll go back over here to Evansville. This is a Class C airport. Okay, when you're going into a Class C airport, you're going to notice that you've got these white boxes that are all around here for... Uh, going into this class C here. All right, so going into class C, the question may be something like, all right, so you want to come in here and land at Evansville, and we're about 30 miles up here to the north. Uh, uh, and what's, who do you need to contact and in what sequence? Well, first thing you want to do is look for these white boxes, and they're going to give you the frequencies. Typically, there's more than one frequency. So this is, uh, it says contact Evansville approach within 20 nautical miles on 124.025. So let's say that that's your correct frequency. We'll talk more about it being the incorrect frequency here in just a second. But so you, the, the answer to your question would be, you would answer the question rather, like I would call, contact a Evansville Approach on 124.025 and they would give me a squawk and then 
uh, and then they would continue to follow me in here until finally at about the point you're five miles away or so from the airport then they're going to hand you off to the tower as as soon as you report the tower in sight they'll say something like 201 tango bravo report the airport in sight and once you do you tell them 201 tango bravo's got the airport in sight they'll hand you off to the tower here 118.7 all right and then you just do whatever they tell you to do all right whatever the tower tells you to do enter a downwind for runway 20 enter you know uh you know, left base for whatever runway. You just do whatever they tell. So if you get asked a question about the sequence of coming into a Class C, then first you want to contact approach control. And then the next question may be, okay, well, how do I know which one of these frequencies am I supposed to contact them on? There's two different frequencies here, 127.35 and 124.025. What would your answer to that be? The answer to that would be I'd look at the airport facility directory under communications, and it will tell me, what sector to use this this frequency 124.05 and what sector to use the other frequency so that's how you know which frequency to use I contact approach control they would then hand me off to the tower and you just simply do whatever the tower tells you to do and you come in and land all right all right let's talk about uh, let's talk about departing out of this class C uh, airport all right one of the things you want to do, and it's never ever wrong, is to start with clearance delivery. So you can start with clearance delivery first. All right. Question is, uh, all right, we're talking about this airport. So how would you determine the clearance delivery frequency for here at Evansville? Well, if you had four flight on your phone, you could look it up quickly, or you could look up standard issue airport facility directory and get the frequency. You would contact uh, um, clearance delivery. Many times in a helicopter, they're just going to tell you to contact the tower direct and tell them what you want to do but but you may contact uh, free, uh i'm sorry clearance delivery and they may hand you off the ground and they may reposition you to a different place on the airport tell you to contact tower there and from that point you would depart so okay so let's talk about flying into class b airport uh number one you want to be really familiar with any class b that you're flying in and out of so you need to Take a really good look at the airport diagram. You need to familiarize yourself with the frequencies and that sort of thing. But now, let's go back to your test. Okay, so what's the magical phrase you have to hear to enter Class B airspace? And the answer is, you are cleared into the Class B airspace. All right? If you don't hear that from the controller, let's say you pose a question, you want to enter Class B airspace, and you call uh, uh, approach control, and you say that uh, you know you want to be inbound to St. Louis here for landing, and uh, they respond back with, uh, yeah, uh, they give you an altimeter setting and a squawk code, and you never hear the phrase, you are cleared into the Class B airspace. Are you cleared? And the answer is no. So if that ever happened to you, then you should specifically ask the controller, am I cleared to enter the Class B airspace? Because you have to be cleared to enter the Class B airspace to make a go of it. So. Okay, another favorite question with uh, flying into a Class B airspace, your, uh, your examiner may say, I'll tell you what, show me where the, where the frequency is for approach control here going into this Class B airspace right here. And the answer is, it's not on the map in front of you. You got to look at the airport facility directory. And I think they print, they don't print it on here to make you, force you to have to look at the airport facility directory so that you'll look at more than just the approach frequencies. But anyway, nonetheless, you're not going to find just in a Class C airport, you have the white boxes off to the side that give you the approach frequency. That's not going to happen at Class B. You've got to hit the airport facility directory or have four flight on your phone or something to look up the approach frequencies. Really, going into a Class B is no more complicated than going into a Class C. You just contact Approach Control. They're going to give you a squawk code. Again, you listen to ATIS first. Contact Approach Control. They're going to give you a squawk code. And uh, they're, again, they're going to hand you off when you get about five miles out from the airport. They're going to ask you to report the airport in sight. And when you do, they'll hand you off to the tower. And then, and again, once again, you do exactly what the tower tells you to do, all right? Uh, whichever runway to use, if you want to go directly to a ramp or one of the, uh, you know, say you want to go to Signature uh, FBO, you can just tell the tower that, and typically they'll clear you direct to the ramp and, and uh, not have you uh, messing around on the, uh, on the runways. But you do whatever they tell you to do. If you're unfamiliar with the Bravo, you can ask for progressive instructions, uh, taxing instructions, 
but it's a really, really good idea to be well, well versed and familiar with that airport if you're going to be flying into and out of it. Number one, you got to have a really good reason to want to go into a B anyway because it's a little bit of a pain in the butt. Everything there is expensive. General aviation fuels, crazy expensive. So unless you got a really good reason to go into Class B, it's a lot easier just to avoid it most of the time. So, okay. So what's their favorite questions? What's the magical phrase you got to have? I got to hear going into Class B, and the phrase is, you are cleared into the Class B. All right. And second one is they're going to ask you about, uh, show me where the approach frequency is. So you, you got that one. Look at the airport facility directory. Next question you're going to say is, well, right here it says no special VFR. Right there, no special VFR. So if I'm in a helicopter and I'm flying in here and I'm getting low on fuel, and it's, uh, you know, 900 foot ceilings and, you know, five miles of visibility, so it's IFR. Can I get a special into, into here to, to go to Signature and get some fuel? Uh, but, you know, it says right here, no special VFR. So does that apply? Can I get a special in a helicopter and go in there? Once again, the answer is yes. You can get a special to get into uh, St. Louis Lambert, despite the fact that it says no special VFR right here on the map. That does not apply to helicopters. Okay, so now I want to show you guys something that uh, hopefully you're familiar with, but maybe not. A lot of people are not very well versed in these, but, you know, if you look here, <clears throat> here's the Class B airport here at Houston. And if you slide over this way, you look and you see this here and this here, and kind of from a just a quick glance, they look like a Class B as well, but they're not. And what these are, these are TERSAs, Terminal Radar Service Area, all right? This is one of Beaumont, Texas here. And if you look right up here, it's got the name Beaumont Tursa, so C Tower Frequency Tab. We'll talk more about that here in just a minute. Here's another one here. This is Lake Charles, Louisiana. Again, at first glance, it looks like a uh, Bravo airspace, but it's not. All it is is a delta. See this blue segmented circle, blue insignia for the airport, blue segmented circle. Same thing here at, uh, at Beaumont, blue segmented circle. Uh, blue insignia these are class d airports but they have radar service available to them and are therefore called a tersa terminal radar service area okay so now the key thing to know about a terminal radar service area is that number one if you don't look at it too quick it looks like a bravo but anyway it's, it's a terminal radar service area participation in a terminal radar service area is voluntary not mandatory voluntary but it's a very good idea if you're going to be around these airports because these are typically quite busy airports and uh, having the uh, assistance of uh, terminal radar is, is a big plus so okay so I want to participate in this TERSA how do I figure out the frequency that's a great question how are you going to figure out the frequency to uh, Lake Charles uh, TERSA well number one it's not printed on the map per se if you've got an old-fashioned paper map section of look go to the front of the map and flip it over on the back back side of the tabs will have all the terps of frequencies if you have uh, if you have four flight on your phone there you go here's Lake Charles right and all you have to do is touch anywhere there like that there we go Lake Charles there's the Tersa go for the details and it gives you two different frequencies 119.35 and 119.8 all right so which one is the one you want to look at well let's go to the airport facility directory and there it is so from the west you would use 119.35 and from the east 119.8 okay so don't let them trip you up on a tersa they look a lot heck of a lot like a, gla a class b if you just glance at it but all it is is a terminal radar service area most of them are shaped, you know, they're circles. If you go out to Palm Springs, actually Palm Springs, uh, Tersa. Let's see if we can find it here real quick. The, uh, there's the Salton Sea. So here's Palm Springs, Tersa. And it's kind of this weird shaped, uh, rectangle like shape here. See, they so got Palm Springs, Tersa there. All right. So most of them are circles. Uh, Palm Springs is kind of a rectangle. And, uh, <clears throat> and again, the key questions on these is that participation is voluntary, not mandatory, but voluntary for TERSA. Okay, so let's just quickly review some of the special use airspace, and that being alert areas, warning areas, also restricted areas, and prohibited areas. So alert, <clears throat> alert areas, warning areas, and MOAs you do not need permission uh, to enter those airspaces. 
Alert areas, those are over the ground. Warning areas are over water, so they're out off the coast. And then MOAs are, you know, within uh, over the continental United States. You do not need permission to fly through an alert area, a warning area, or an MOA, all right? You do need permission to fly through a restricted area, and we'll talk about how you, you know, how you attempt to get permission here shortly. And then prohibited areas, it's not going to happen. You're going to get intercepted and maybe shot down if you're messing around in a prohibited area, all right? So let's just quickly fill some questions on those, uh, those special use areas. So here we are, here's Palm Springs down here, uh, down here in the bottom. We're going to go up here. Here's a turtle MOA. It's a great big MOA here. So if he was to point at this MOA and say, okay, I'm here, and uh, can I fly around in this airspace here? Uh, if, I, if I do want to fly around this space, who do I have to talk to? And the answer is you don't have to talk to anybody because it's an MOA, and you don't need permission to fly around in an MOA. Same thing if he was here. He says, okay, well, I want to fly around the mountaintops here and down in the valleys and all over this place inside this magenta shaded area right through here. Who do I need to talk to to fly in there? Once again, the answer is no one. You don't need permission to fly inside of this MOA. But all right, let's slide over here. Here's a couple of restricted areas, 29 Palms. That's a military area here. And so you've got several restricted areas right here. And if you wanted to figure out, uh, you know, you wanted to attempt to get permission to cross this restricted area, I can tell you very, very likely it's not going to happen. But if you wanted to <laughs> call and ask, how do you do that? Well, once again, if you had four flight on your phone, pull up 29 Palms area here. Okay, so here's here's 29 Palms, and here's the whoop, here's the big restricted area by 29 Palms. So if you just touch that, and there it is, 2501D touch it go to details and it tells you it goes it's unlimited so it goes all the way up from the surface all the way up and there's the controlling frequency of los angeles center 128.15 and it is uh activation is continuous all right so likely you're not going to get permission to fl uh, fly through that restricted area but that's who you would ask for permission who would then soundly tell you no <laughs> very likely so so that's restricted areas all your special use airspace right